also very grateful uh, Bernard, Professor Bernard Gerstrom and the, the entire Gerstrom and the entire physics department. I'm sorry, it's late in the month for me. <laughs> the entire physics department uh, for the support they've given to this lecture. Uh, and and I, I want to take a few minutes and thank the, the entities on campus who have been ongoing in their support for the, the, uh, the center's events, beginning with the Office of the Provost that's been very strong uh, in, in, uh, in material and uh, uh, emotional, psychological, spiritual <laughs> support as well. English, and I, I'm also very grateful to the Department of English Exile study to the College of Arts and Sciences, to the College of Arts, Arch of Architecture, and, and the Theater, uh, to the Alumni Association, to Channel 2, WPBT, Public, uh, Public Television, Milwaukee, which records all of our events and makes them available on the, uh, the, the center website. So there is an archive for anyone who uh, wants to relive the, the magic of any evening uh, or if for people who have uh, missed, a, missed an event, uh, the, uh, the, the quality is absolutely first rate. I can say that from experience, having tried to do it myself the first year that we had talks, and believe me, Sarah Ryan does a, does a far better job than anything that I have attempted. In fact, my recording was so bad, I can't use it. So <laughs> if it weren't for Sarah, we'd be in a hell of a mess. I'm also very grateful to the graduate student, so the English graduate student Association and to uh, Sigma Tau Delta, the English Undergraduate Association, the English Undergraduate Honor Society. Um, there are two events that, that I, I want to uh, mention in particular that are coming up, a number of center events, and if you uh, are interested in receiving more information, there is a, a, a sign-up sheet for our mailing list, and uh, I'd be very happy to have you on and to keep you uh, you okay. But there's a terrific speaker that is coming later on this week, Richard Carney from uh, Boston College, who is going to talk about an atheism in, uh, on Friday at 7 o'clock in the, uh, the uh, Graham Center Hall. I think it's going to be a very good night. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, an opportunity to hear someone who can talk about um, theology in a postmodern world seemingly contradictory subjects, but he, he's very good at bringing the two together. Uh, <clears throat> one reason to get on the, uh, the mailing list is to be aware of events like this, uh, an, an exhibition that is coming to the Coral Gable Museum in the fall entitled uh, Beyond the Swastika Jim Crow. It focuses on the experiences of German academics who came to the United States before world, shortly before World War II fleeing Nazi Germany and really only had a place to come uh, because black, uh, traditionally black colleges and universities opened their doors to them. Anti-Semitism was still rampant in American academia before World War II and it was hard unless you were Einstein to find a place at Princeton or some other school like that. But uh, black colleges were very welcoming and they, they, they began uh, uh, a, a partnership of, of three or four decades that was very important to American education. The, the exhibit touches on that, and there'll be a number of, uh, uh, of presentations that will take place in, in, in relation to the exhibit planned by Professor Milbauer and uh, Professor Sutton of the English Department uh, in conjunction with the center. And we're very excited about it, so if you, if you sign up on the mailing list, I'll be sure that you get plenty of information that's all the commercial announcements I have. If I can uh, now uh, ask Professor Gerson to, to come up to the uh, front of the room and introduce our speak speaker for tonight. Happy to do so. Thank you. You also already gave an answer to a question I've always wondered about. The Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton was created by a department store model in New Jersey and accepted a lot of the Jewish scientists in the 30s. Now that Einstein was the letter of reference that he needed. I always wondered what about the Jewish academics but that weren't scientists? Now you've given me an answer of where they may have gone, actually. And I try to remember the name of the department store chain in New Jersey that um, was the source of the funding. 
the <laughs> Institute, but it was a department store chain, and I don't know if that name uh, exists any longer. Uh, but getting to the topic, I'm very happy to be here this evening for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is the Center for the Humanities is what makes universities special. So it, this whole program is absolutely wonderful. It's an important aspect of the university. I'm also happy to be here because I'm going to be introducing my friend and colleague, Professor James Webb from the Physics Department. And he's going to be speaking this evening about his passion for astronomy. And I want to parse that title of the presentation, or the one that I just uh, paraphrased, to two aspects. One is astronomy. Everybody loves astronomy. You certainly did when you were children, and it's still in you whether you realize it or not. But everybody loves astronomy. But the other aspect is his passion. And here's something that is getting to be rarer and rarer amongst people in modern day society. And I don't know why, perhaps a topic uh, for discussion in the future. But you think about yourselves and you might say, do I really have a passion about something? And I don't mean ice cream sundaes. That's, <laughs> I mean, do I have an intellectual passion or a passion about something that's intellectual cultural, but something that I really want to spend a lot of effort working on, that I'm willing to spend a lot of effort working at, on. Because it certainly makes your life richer if you have a passion. Uh, Professor Webb has three passions that I know of. Uh, he'll, I believe only he's talking about his passion in astronomy tonight, but uh, that, that'll be up to him. Uh, if you want to get something accomplished, you need to be willing to put in the hard work need to have a certain level of passion. The greater the task, the greater the amount of passion that you need. If you have a jigsaw puzzle with a small number of pieces, you only need a little bit of passion to get it done. But if you're trying to accomplish the task of a jigsaw puzzle that has lots of pieces, you need a lot greater passion in order to have the perseverance to stick with it. Well, uh, Jim Webb's passion for astronomy has got a literally a concrete representation, literally a concrete representation on the campus. And it required a tremendous amount of passion and perseverance. And I'm talking about the Stockard Astro Science Center. It was Jim's passion along with the financial help of the university and the state of Florida that helped build that Stock Observatory, a wonderful facility that will soon have a telescope in it. And again, you need to build the observatory and then bring in the telescope. You don't bring the telescope, leave it out in the rain, and then the whole hope that you can build an observatory. And so the telescope has already been ordered. It's on its way. It's going to be installed late April or in May. Uh, but the point is, in order to get something like this built on campus, and this is no longer an artist's sketch. This is a photograph. That artist's sketch was around for 15 years, at least. <laughs> at least. That requires passion. But with that kind of passion and perseverance, great things can be done. So now I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Webb to talk about his passion for astronomy. Thank you, Bernard. And uh, thank you much for inviting me to uh, give a talk here at this wonderful uh, venue. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about astronomy and basically life among the stars. Um, astronomy is one of the most important versions of science because it allows us to put ourselves in perspective with the rest of the universe. I mean, we're so used to thinking things are so important, like the traffic in Miami or they're doing construction on Cal Miami Trail. Uh, that's a very, very small, small, insignificant part of the universe compared to what we see when we look out. And uh, facilities like the Stocker Astro Science Center that uh, Dr. Gersman mentioned um, helps us teach students about the rest of the universe, everything else that's out there. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, life among the stars. Um, can we uh, turn some of these slides down a little bit so the slides can show up a little better? So uh, we live. This is our home in the cosmos. We live in a little planet, quite a sleepy little planetary system at the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. 
Uh, originally, of course, human beings thought that we were the center of the universe and that everything revolved around us. Uh, astronomical discoveries put us further and further and further out of that principal point until now. We're just around some anonymous galaxy, center of the galaxy, we're not even the center of the galaxy, not the center of the solar system. Um, the Earth happens to be in the middle of a very particular uh, distance away from the sun called the habitable zone. We'll talk a little more about that later, but that's very important to know that the that, Earth that happens to lie in that zone because that's the zone which a planet can support life. If the planet is not in a habitable zone, we could not exist on the planet. Uh, every life form, and this is a uh, came from Carl Sagan in the 1970s. How appropriate I'm giving this talk because the new cosmic series is coming out on television. Uh, I think next weekend, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is taking Carl Sagan's place. I think he'll do an excellent job. Uh, but this is Carl Sagan's every form, every life form, every person living and dead, every king, every conqueror, everybody who was conquered has lived in this little planet. Just one little pale blue dot. You might wonder, uh, and astronomers wondered for a long time, is the solar system special? Are there other planets around other stars? I mean, scientifically, when we run our computer models of the formation of the stars, planets always form. But in, up until about 15 years ago, we had never detected a single planet other than our own solar system. Now, of course, uh, our, we found over 3,841 new candidates for star, uh, planets around other stars. A total of 4,876 exo uh, solar planets could be out there. There's about 1,035 that uh, are really confirmed, a lot more candidates. The size of these planets range from Earth mass planets, maybe smaller than Earth, to large Jupiters, something like 10 times the mass of Jupiter. So the answer is our science was right. The predictions we made based on computer models turned out to be correct. Now, there are details we didn't anticipate. We didn't think Jupiters could exist at one astronomical unit, basically as the same distance we are from the sun. We find in other planetary systems, there are massive star, massive planets like Jupiter's, very close to their companion stars. But that doesn't mean our science is wrong, that means our science needs corrections. And that's what data is for. So the scientific method at work, <coughs> we're making these discoveries, we're seeing these planets, and we're directing them. One thing that life on Earth, and especially in uh, recent events in, in in the world today, like uh, political events, really tells us that we're shown what can happen by three planets in our solar system, a total of three planets. We have the planet Venus over here, planet Earth down there, and the planet Mars there on the right. They're all roughly around the habitable zone. The Earth is smack in the middle of the habitable zone of the sun. Venus is on the inner edge, and Mars is on the outer edge. Uh, Venus is about the twin of Earth. It's about the same size, about the same mass about the same chemical composition. And Venus looks like it has nice, fluffy blue cloud, white clouds and blue, looks like the ocean down there. You think, man, that'd be a great place for a vacation. <laughs> Except that as you descend into this atmosphere, the clouds are not water vapor. They're hydrofluoric and hydrosulfuric acid. The atmospheric pressure is about 100 times that on Earth. The temperature is about 900 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface. So you wonder, what's going wrong with Venus? It's in habitable zone, close enough, it's got the same, the same chemistry as the Earth, the same uh, rock composition. But well, the thing is that went wrong in Venus, as Carl Sagan identified, was the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse gases came up in the atmosphere, blocked. So what happens is the radiation from the sun comes through the clouds, hits the surface as it's radiated by infrared radiation, and the greenhouse gases block it from escaping. So it keeps heating up and heating up and heating up. And then all the water boils and evaporates. And then the rocks start boiling, and the rocks release toxic gases like hydrofluoric acids. Could that happen on Earth? Absolutely. That could happen. And what do we have to do to make that happen? Well, we have to dump particulates into the atmosphere. We have to ignore greenhouse effects. We have to keep, uh, you know, keep, keep on what we're doing. It'll happen. Uh, the question is, how long will it take? And the answer is, we don't know. We can't predict whether it's going to rain tonight or not. How can we predict how long these atmospheric effects are going to take? But the point is, we can learn from other planets in our solar system what not to do with our own planet. So this is urban development. And you know, learn what from other cities around you what not to do. Learn from other planets what not to do with your planet. 
Mars, for instance. Mars used to have running water. It used to have lakes. We see concrete proof that there were rivers and lakes on the surface of Mars billions of years ago. And the question is, it can't, water can't exist on the surface now because it doesn't have enough atmosphere. What happened to Mars' atmosphere? The answer seems to be that um, Mars could develop an ozone layer. Ozone, as you know, is uh, weakly united uh, oxygen molecules in our upper atmosphere that basically absorbs the ultraviolet light from the sun. The ultraviolet light is very damaging not only to biological cells, it's causing skin, skin cancer, but also causes the, the atmosphere to evaporate off very easily. So what are we doing to our uh, ozone layer? Oh yeah, we're destroying it, aren't we? The question is, is there intelligent life on Earth? I'm not sure. So Mars is a, a different tale. It's a different thing not to do with your planet. So by looking around using astronomy, we can tell what not to do with our planet. Those are the other plants in the background. They don't tell us much about ourselves because they're totally different. Uh, Mercury is too close to the sun. It's too hot. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are totally gaseous planets, totally different characters from the Earth. So they don't really give us a lot of information. Uh, right now, we have uh, experiments on Mars that go around the surface trying to find signs of life. So a uh, good question is, is there life elsewhere in the universe? Good question. Astronomers have been asking themselves for a long time. In fact, some of the first people to uh, ask themselves that, besides philosophers, were astronomers. And those first people, the first person uh, by the name of Frank Drake, uh, was not allowed to request telescope time on national facilities to search for life. Most people thought it was a useless thing. Why do it? There's no life out there. So he had to sneak around and put in proposals to do other observations, and then just a few minutes in search. So let me cut. He developed an equation called the Drake equation, and you can get this in some of the video. There's also websites you could go to. And basically, you put in various things and try to determine, try to figure out the number of civilizations that should exist within our galaxy. And some of these factors are the average rate of star formation. We know that. We can observe that using astronomy. A uh, fraction of those stars that might have planets. We had no clue until about 10 years ago when we started finding these extrasolar planets. And now we know that number is very high. Probably about 80% of the single stars have planets in orbit around them, maybe even higher. The average number of planets that can actually <coughs> hold life, those are the ones that orbit around in the stars' habitable zones that can support liquid water. And that's life as we know it. Life exists in some other form that we don't know about. This equation has to be changed, but based on water and uh, carbon. Average number of planets that uh, can develop life at some point, that's the sticky point of it. We only know of one event of life occurring, and that was on Earth. And we think all life sprang from that particular event. How likely is that? Astronomers can't tell you that, except the biologists. So I call the biologists on the carpet. They have to give us that answer. If you put the proper chemicals under the right conditions, Will life always alone? Or is, are we freaks of nature? I tend to think that there's a, that should be a large number. If the chemicals are right, if the situation is right, if enough time is right, life should evolve. But that's an opinion. I have no evidence in which to base that. So and this is the lifetime of civilizations that can uh, send signals or receive signals that are detectable. Um, that's a great question, too. We've been transmitting for, what, maybe? 80, 90 years now, out in space, and uh, those radio signals, the speed of light, so they've, they've emanated about 80 or 90 uh, uh, light years away. And so only planets within, only life forms within that range could even know we were here. Otherwise, they would not know we were here. And so it seems like radio communication is the best way of determining whether extraterrestrials actually exist or not. So where do we look? Uh, we look for Earth-like planets. Uh, some of the tools that we use for detecting life, you may recognize this from James Bond movies. <laughs> they used it to uh, do other things. But uh, that's actually the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. And uh, this is the uh, Allen Telescope, and this is uh, in Greenbelt. And these telescopes are used to look for radio signals from alien civilizations, as we'll say. 
new civilizations. You might say, well, you know, the radio spectrum is big. How do we know where they're going to be translated? And how do we know that these signals do arrive from a new civilization? And it turns out that if they're astronomers, and they probably will be if they have the ability to emit radio signals, they'll be astronomers, they'll know that there's this little thing called the water hole between a hydrogen line and an OH line that every astronomer knows about. And there's not a whole lot of interference with galactic noise, our atmosphere, quantum limit, background. It's a little hole there. And so if they're smart, like we are, they'll be transmitting and looking at precisely those frequencies. So telescopes like the Allen telescope and the Arecibo telescope tune in to that frequency range and see if they can see some signal that's not distinctly periodic like pulsars, that has some type of modulation that might be due to, it might carry information. And that's the way we would, that's the most likely way to detect any new civilization. Uh, this telescope was used back in the 70s. Anybody remember that? Uh, probably none of the students, but to actually send out a signal. Carl Sagan used it to send out a signal to whoever heard it, gave us our location of Earth, of Earth in relation to pulsars, these uh, pulsating uh, rotating neutron stars. So an alien civilization could see our exact position. It gave, uh, basically encoded into the signal was our DNA strands, all sorts of information about us. And that made a lot of people upset because they think, the aliens are going to know how to kill us. They're going to know that we're good food. <laughs> so but he sent the signal out. And uh, to date, no one has ever said that they've received a signal that seems to be from extraterrestrial intelligence. There's also the common UFO thing for that alien visitors. You hear all these reports of UFOs. Uh, I had my own UFO encounter. I'll tell you about it very briefly. Um, I was actually, before I went to college, I was working in an automotive factory. And I used to read all sorts of books. I didn't know I could go to college, so I read all sorts of books. I read about uh, UFOs, I read about astronomy, I read about physics. And I was pretty much bowed up on all that stuff. And as I started learning more about physics, I started realizing she you know, stuff is totally garbage, right? Um, but I started then debunking UFO cases. And I get calls when I was a graduate student. And the secretary would always send these people to me. I saw something. What is it? You can always figure out it's either Venus or it's an airplane or it's a weather balloon or something. There's always a, a good explanation. These people are simply totally convinced. So I got a call one day, I was at my office from UFO Hunters. Have anybody seen that on the History Channel? <laughs> so, and I figured, History Channel? And I had to watch that show, so I watched it and it was just total garbage. <laughs> so I called them back and said, no, I'm not doing it. They wanted me to, to take this case of a guy who thought he, he flew his plane from Andrews Island through a mini black hole and arrived in Miami much faster than it was physically possible. <laughs> so he had to go through a wormhole. And so I said, look, you know, I don't want to even talk to you guys. I've seen your show. And, and he said, no, 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 we really want your scientific input. We want to figure this out. So they sent me the material, and I figured out what actually happened. Uh, he was actually wrong. His, his uh, altimeter was off. He got into a tailwind. He, I, I took the you know, fuel capacity of this plane. He kicked over this plane, and I figured out he had exactly on time, the exact tailwind and everything. Totally made sense. So they invited me to the Bahamas, and I met the UFO hunters guys, and they filmed it. And I explained to them that uh, I even done the, calcula the calculations about how massive the black hole would have had to be for them to fly plane through the event horizon and not get destroyed. And then another, another black hole, the other black hole's mouth would have to be moving about eight tenths of speed of light, and what effects that would have on the solar system. You know? <laughs> and so I explained it, and they were really nice, and very supportive. Of course, when I got back and I watched my little segment on the UFO hunters, it had a little bitty clip of me saying, yeah, uh, wormholes could exist mathematically, and, and uh, you know, that's it. And then they had this crazy guy on after me. So I was infuriated, and so I wrote a letter to the uh, Skeptical Inquirer, uh, and I put them on the Skeptical Inquirer watch list as the worst show on television for science and treatment science. But that was my uh, encounter, and of course, I was probably laying there in, in, in the bay saying, you know, there's no way of UFOs while the alien was behind me, uh, putting bunny ears on me, right? <laughs> so UFO hunters, terrible cities. <laughs> so back to science. Um, is the universe dead besides Earth? Uh, that's a good question. As we look out into space, even in molecular clouds in the galaxy, 
there are the building blocks of life. There are amino acids floating around. Uh, water and carbon are some of the most common things on planetary surfaces and interstellar gas clouds. Planets now we see are everywhere. The more ability we have to detect them, the more we find. Now life has been found on nearest uh, neighbors to date, even Mars, which is studied pretty thoroughly. Uh, but again, Mars only had a limited window among which life could evolve because it lost most of its atmosphere due to the fact that it boiled away. So if it did form on Mars, it was early in the formation of the solar system, probably about three billion years ago, and that life, the traces of life, might be under the surface. So we can't send little robots crawling on the surface to dig down far enough to see those traces where they would probably most likely be. So we're still not done looking on Mars. But no concrete evidence of alien visitations, uh, no radio signals detected from any other star planetary systems yet. But this would be one of the most profound discoveries of our times if we did detect signals from an extraterrestrial civilization. The thing is, we can't wait on them to solve all of our problems. Right now, it appears uh, we're pretty much on our own. This is a good picture. Um, again, I go back to Carl Sagan, one of my heroes. Uh, he had the Voyager spacecraft. The Voyager spacecraft were spacecraft launched in the 1970s that went out and investigated Jupiter and Saturn and then went on the grand tour, went on to Uranus and Neptune. And as it was leaving the planetary system, he turned it around and looked back and took a picture of the Earth. And the Earth was one pixel in that camera, a little pale blue pixel there, and streams coming off of some of the other planets. Uh, and that's the home that we live in, that everybody we've ever known, all life forms we've ever had anything to do with or ever heard of, lives there. And this background here is sort of cool. That's the cosmic microwave background. So that's the background radiations we're bathed in every day as a function of the formation, leftover from the formation of the universe. So that's our little abode in the entire universe right there. That's it. That's all we got. Can it be a home forever? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. The Earth has changed remarkably over geologic time. In fact, how many of you realize that the Earth's the original atmosphere did not have any oxygen in it? In fact, the our atmosphere should not contain oxygen. That was put there by plant life. So people like us who breathe, breathe oxygen could not have existed in early Earth. So the Earth's atmosphere was transformed by life uh, early on. We're transforming it again, unfortunately, with uh, climate change. The uh, solar constant increases with time. That means as the sun ages, as it uses nuclear fuel, it gets a little bit brighter every year. Now, not a lot, but a very tiny amount. But we're getting down where we can measure this total constant increase. And as a function of time, this gets bigger and bigger. It's going to have more and more of an effect on our atmosphere. It pushes that habitable zone a little bit further out each time. And uh, the Earth's climate changes due to natural causes, and of course, we have been causing climate change. Unfortunately, um, we went through a number of years where nobody believed that we were causing climate change, and we got rid of some of these safeguards that we were, scientists were trying to put into place. On top of that, the Earth is a dangerous place. Could this happen here to us? Absolutely, it could. It's very, very possible. This is a our depiction of a large asteroid slamming into Earth. And you wonder, if this ever happens? And the answer is yes. We have geologic evidence that the demise of the dinosaurs and a lot, about 98% of the species that were alive at the time were killed by an impact of a large comet or asteroid in the Yucatan Peninsula. We see the crater. And we see that material from that particular asteroid was strewn all over the Earth. So there's a particular layer called the KT boundary where that material from that impactor flew up, filled the atmosphere, blocked the light, all the cold-blooded animals died off, dinosaurs. Only our little furry ancestors were able to survive, and probably mosquitoes and rats and things like that. And that's, that's how we survived. But this could happen. In fact, this has happened many times. All those red dots are known uh, craters from large impactors on the surface of the Earth. Uh, have any of you ever been to Arizona and actually visited Barringer Meteor Crater? It's a large meteor crater in Arizona that's a fairly recent one. Uh, it's not a global uh, destroyer, but it's big enough to make you think, wow, if that landed in New York City, from that landed in London, Paris, 
going to be a huge event. So they're scattered all over the world. And of course, the Earth is covered mostly by water, of course, so we don't even see craters for those. But those impacts would not cause craters, they cause tsunamis on the local land masses. And you don't see the ones, uh, you see it. And this, these are fairly recent because of weathering. Weathering basically gets rid of all of the uh, evidence. But uh, those are the ones that we know about. That mess is basically the number of earth crossing asteroids. So we've had a program that's been looking for earth crossing asteroids. So this is the orbit of Mercury, orbit of Venus, orbit of the Earth, orbit of Mars, and all these other circles are asteroids of no uh, size bigger than maybe 100 meters uh, orbits. And you can see they're crossing the Earth's orbit constantly. So, uh, there's lots of large impactors out there, and we don't even know where they all are. Uh, there's a video. Uh, if you go to YouTube and you watch that video, it shows, uh, basically it's a video of the, of the discovery, as a function of time, the discovery of asteroids. And it's just amazing. Uh, when they, you can tell when NASA launches a new satellite, or when we have a new program funded by the National Science Foundation to find these asteroids, how many asteroids they find. They found, uh, I think it's over 90,000. 90, asteroids that uh, could potentially impact Earth at some point in time. Uh, but solar system is a dangerous place to live. And uh, one of the things that Neil deGrasse Tyson said that I really admired before was saying is, it's not that we might, all civilization might be destroyed by the impact. But the worst thing is that we know about it, and we have the technology to do something about it, and we don't. Just because we don't choose to. That's the worst part. Here's some uh, near-Earth encounters. It's a date since 1914 up to 2012. And just look at the project size. It's 500 meters. There's a kilometer, 5,000, uh, 5 kilometers, 5.4 thousand meters. And um, basically, some of them came in very, very close, hundreds of thousands of miles away, uh, I thought of kilometers away from the Earth. And we know that recently, we had a couple of events. The asteroid DA14 came between, uh, basically skirted the solar system in 2013, and then exploding meteor in Russia that injured about 200 people, knocked out uh, windows all over the place. And the worst thing is that we only have the same amount of people looking for these earth crossing asteroids that operate a McDonald's. That's how many people are doing this. And the amount of money that NSF sinks into this is very small compared to the amount of money that they sent and they sunk into a lot of other things. So we have a very small amount of people trying to save the Earth from these impact asteroids. And it seems such a ridiculous thing. What really concerns me, though, uh, more than that, is that you know I see students, my students in introductory classes. I see my nephews and nieces and great nephews and nieces. They're always with their heads down. They're concerned about their iPads or their mini, mini phones or something like that, they're never really looking up. And while they're looking down, making that next text message, there could be something crashing in, uh, destroying the entire Earth. Uh, it's just amazing to me that we don't take this threat seriously. Are there other Earths? I've already told you we found lots of other planets of ranging in sizes from uh, Earth size. Are there other Earths in habitable zones? And here's just an example of some that I found that uh, are in habitable zones of their parent planets. Uh, some of the stars are smaller, than them, so they have to be closer in, so the stars are larger. Uh, Tau Ceti is one of the closest ones. And it's got a planet of there's the size of the Earth in relation, larger than the Earth. But it could conceivably have all the characteristics of a the life-bearing planet. So those are the places we would want to look through just to find them. The question is, are any of them habitable? Or inhabited right now? Uh, we don't know the answer to that yet. Again, the habitable zone is a small area, and the Earth is right in the middle of the Sun's habitable zone. Uh, Venus is a little too close, one is a little too far away, but they're very close to the edges. And the other question is how can we get there? Even if we could find that there's another asteroid coming in and hit the Earth. We want to send a mission to one of these other stars. How do we get there? 
because we're not really doing anything about it. Um, I don't know how many of you, I know a few of you were at TED Talk. And I took that TED Talk very seriously because it was a message that I wanted to get out. It looks like we as a civilization, at least in the United States, are at a crossroads. Uh, NSF funding is way down. We've basically disseminated NASA. I mean, I'm very familiar with uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. I worked there for a year. I have lots of friends there, Kennedy Space Center. And we basically lost about three quarters of the jobs that Kennedy Space Center were just, they were just kicked out. They were just lost due to budget cuts. Uh, there are no real missions for NASA. We don't have any space shuttles right now with the crisis with Russia. What are we going to do with the space station? We have a space station we can't even send people up to or get people back down from it unless we use Russian, uh, Russia's rockets. Uh, at that time, the James Webb Space Telescope, the next generation space telescope, funding was in jeopardy. It's a little firmer footing now, but it's still not completely done. And um, what really got me was one day I turned on CNN. This has been uh, about six or seven years ago. And when they had the trials about global warming, where researchers were getting their funds, or, you know, their uh, 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 United States, the state, the state funded funds rejected because of their talking about global warming being caused by humans. Uh, they basically had their NSF funding that was being cut uh, because of politics. That's the worst thing. I never thought we'd see that happen in the United States. So we have a couple of options. We have one option. Since we're stuck here on Earth, we, don't, we can't go anywhere. Um, don't fund education. Kill NASA like we're doing. Retreat back into our ship. One of the first books I ever read was Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmic Connection. The Cosmic Connection basically said that, look, we're all citizens of the universe. We're not just citizens of the country where we live in, the state, or the continent. Uh, we're all citizens of the universe. We're all connected, and we're all here in this together. And uh, we have to protect ourselves. We have to go forward. And that's done by education. Uh, we want to get out and, and be global and be cosmic citizens, not just global citizens. So it looks like we're retreating back into our shell. We're not funding the space pro program. We're not funding higher education the way we should. And that's what we're going to be talking about as the waters rise for global warming. New York becomes a survivor Earth. Uh, or we can go option two, fund education, lead state science and decision-making process, fund NASA and space explorations, and actually become those cosmic citizens that Carl Sagan said we should become. Uh, I hope we, we're choosing option two. In the future, when I was growing up, um, my favorite show, I, you could probably guess this, was Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have guessed, right? Um, Star Trek had people of even aliens, of all the different nationalities, participating in exploration. Sure, they had battles and they fought, but if you watch the series, everything behind the main show is not fighting, it's not military. It was exploration. It was making connections. It was getting out and being a little, uh, uh, cosmic citizens. The new Star Trek movies are a totally different genre. They're all fighting and all battles and all blowing up. And I, I can't get into it like they did in Star Trek. Um, I thought back in the 70s when I watched people walking on the surface of the moon. Yes, we really did walk on the surface of the moon. I know some of the younger people weren't born then. A lot of my students weren't born then. And a lot of my students saw me, well, I read that was a hoax. We really did. And believe it or not, that we went on the moon with computers that had uh, about, the memory was about 200 kilobytes. I said kilobytes, not megabytes or gigabytes, kilobytes. A lot of those computer circuits were hand woven by people with wires. Uh, very primitive compared to what we have today. And so people say, well, we can't go to the moon. We don't have the technology. That's ridiculous. <laughs> we have all the technology we need. It's just that we haven't got the desire to do it too often. The James Webb Space Telescope, no, it's not named after me, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. sure it was named after uh, the director of NASA when we landed on the moon. He was instrumental in making that space program operate. Uh, it's going to be the next generation Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope has shown us so much about the universe that we never knew before. It's uh, allowed us to look into uh, distant places in the universe that we had no idea existed before. And in fact, if you go over to the Stalker Astro Science Center, and I invite you all to do that, 
if you look up in the exhibition hall, you see not a starry sky, but you see images of galaxies. So Hubble Space Telescope found a place in our galaxy that was devoid of gas and dust, and there were no stars in that area, or very few stars. And it peered out that and looked out for several weeks and just taking an exposure. Apparently an empty place. When the picture came back down, the CCD image came back down and they looked at it, it had billions of galaxies. And so the early, it was, these galaxies were the furthest galaxies that we've ever seen. And so we had them painted on our dome in the Sawgrass for Science Center. So when you walk in, uh, look up and that's what you'll see. And that basically opened our eyes to lots of things that we didn't know about the universe. Uh, the Hubble Space, uh, so the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be even more powerful than Hubble and allow us to look not only further out in space, but further back into time, very close to the origin of the Big Bang. And it's going to allow us to peer into dust clouds and see planets in the process of formation and stars in the process of formation that we've never seen before. So it's going to be very spectacular. And again, it was, um, funding was very doubtful for a while because of mainly politics. So that's going to be something. So success, this is what I envision of success. We have spacecraft that are able to study the universe the way we should. We have people out there going to planets like Mars, going out in space. One of our students, our astronomy students, I'm happy to say, our physics majors, Patrick Ford, you've probably seen him in the paper or his name, uh, he's on the Mars One thing, and he's made the final cut for astronauts who might go to, to Mars. So they're, they're, they're going to do a couple more cuts, but he, he's made a good cut. They started out as, uh, I think, 100,000 people, and they're down to maybe 600. And this is what they're going to be doing, hopefully, uh, sometime in the near future. Um, this brings up another issue. It's called the privatization of space that's been popular. Uh, they're dialing down, as they dial down NASA, they reroute some of NASA's money into private firms and try to get them to go to space. And uh, SpaceX is one example. I have a problem with that <laughs> because uh, private companies tend to look at for profit. And that seems to be a bad thing about doing something for humanity, regardless of national, nationality, regardless of uh, profit. And our failure results in this type of scenario. Uh, we don't deal with global warming the way we should be, the way we could be dealing with it. We don't deal with the threats. And uh, who knows, it could be one of these science fiction movies that we've seen in movie theaters. So who knows what the future will hold, but education is the way to go. I'm really hoping New Cosmos series, which is known as Tyson, is going to do for your this upcoming generation what uh, Carl said he did for our generation. And I'm um, hoping that's the case. So that's all I really want to talk about. I'm happy to answer any questions. And, and, and I, before I do stop, I want to invite you all to our next star party, which is Friday night, this coming Friday. We have Russell Romanella, who is previously from NASA, he finally retired. But he came, he's going to come back and tell us about the direction NASA is taking. That's 8 p.m. in CP145. And after that, we'll open up the Stalker Astro Science Center. And we'll have the telescopes on the roof open if it's clear weather. So you can see Jupiter, you can see the moon, you can see maybe even Saturn or Titan in the sky down. You can see it, uh, probably Mars. Uh, and I'll also uh, take tours down to our Starship Control Room. And you have to ask me about that when you watch my so thank you very much for your attention. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, one is that um, NASA's funding is, is obviously decreased, and um, I understand they're not sending any more manned flights anymore. Um, are they still are they still focusing on, on space exploration with this with this the amount of funding that they have? And the second part of my question is is kind of related. What would it take for the United States to increase its funding for NASA and to get, once again, interested in space exploration, in your opinion? So, the answer to the first question is, what NASA has now been charged to do is not do manned space exploration themselves, but to take the money given to NASA and route it to these private companies, like SpaceX and some of these other companies, and they think they can do a better job of more cheaply putting people in orbit up to the space station. Uh, but there are only private plans, NASA has no plans right now, concrete plans, to explore Mars, to go back to the moon, to do things like that. So uh, right now there are no 
NASA is just sort of handling the money for these private corporations. I think that's, personally, I think that's a mistake. That's just me, because I don't trust businesses. I've never been a business person. The second part of the question is, what does it take? The answer is, I wish I knew. I would be, I would be right there doing it if I knew what, what to do. Uh, right now, they're threatening to cut funding for national observatories. The NSF is cutting funding for facilities that are uh, retiring telescopes that are absolutely critical for locating these Earth-crossing asteroids. But the money is just going away. Uh, as Neil deGrasse pointed out, I think it was one-tenth one of one penny of everybody's tax money uh, would be enough to support NASA to the level that we need NASA to be supported, to bring back all of those people who have been laid off, start building rockets that we can actually send people up to the space station, maybe even a lunar uh, plan to go to the moon. Uh, NASA right now is concentrating on sending out unmanned spacecraft like rovers that are on the moon right now, uh, uh, sorry, on Mars right now, um, but we don't really have a focus, and I'm a big, uh, I love Obama, and I'm a big proponent of Obama, but I'm very disappointed that he has not rescued NASA. I know he has a lot on his plate and everything, but it's a big disappointment that NASA is falling on the wayside, and uh, it's just disturbing. I, I don't know what it takes. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew. You said that the new telescope that they're building can peer further into the origins of the, of the Big Bang. Do you mean the first planets to be created by the Big Bang? So basically what happens is uh, as you look further and further out, uh, the light gets redshifted because the Earth is, uh, the universe is expanding more rapidly. In it. So, it's gonna, so the new telescope, the James Webb, looks in the infrared part of the spectrum. So that's exactly the frequencies at which the light from the first galaxies, called the assembling of galaxies, so we won't be able to see planets out there or maybe individual stars, but we'll be able to see galaxies that first form after the origin of, of the universe. So that could be very exciting to see how galaxies were first assembled. And also that infrared allows us to peer through the gas clouds that basically cover. So what happens when stars form, you have a huge gas cloud, the center collapses and the star forms in that center. It's completely shrouded by the excess gas and dust outside, so we can't see it. But the infrared light goes right through that, so we'll be able to see the stars in there collapsing. And so the G4 telescope not only is going to be bigger, it's going to be out of, uh, beyond the orbit of the moon, but it's going to be sensitive to those frequencies that are really critical that we understand what's going on. So it's going to be pretty cool. Plus, it has my name. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I teach in religious studies, and part of, it seems to me that part of the problem, um, and I teach religion and science and religion and nature stuff, and part of it is that our extants practices are you know, thousands of years outdated in terms of what we know about the universe, right? And so again, it's, it helps us to think very small. Um, what do you think about projects like Brian Swim and, and you know, uh, Tom, to try to narrate the universe as a story that we can fit ourselves and see ourselves as sort of uh, conscious, the universe come to conscious life itself and that sort of thing? Do you think we need new, like, we need making practices and narratives based upon uh, the, the universe stories so to speak, or? Yeah, that is one approach because I think what's happened is that society has been sort of becoming numb to the whole science and astronomy thing. Uh, when Carl Sagan first came out with Cosmos, it opened everybody's eyes, and, and he really was great at getting out there and getting the people who are not educated, who do not understand the physics, or are afraid of the math, and demonstrating them that they can understand these processes that are going on, and that they can. And, you know, enjoy and, and go along this, this journey throughout the universe with him. Since then, nothing has been done, and the science has been coming at us. And, and you know, people get excited when we land something on Mars, but you know, they, they tweet about it for about ten minutes, and then they get more interested in the guy's hairdo uh, than they do <laughs> the actual discoveries that they find on Mars. So I think what we need is to get society and somehow or other, maybe that's a method to get them interested again, to get them to see that you know. We live in a universe that is out there that is very rich and it has a lot of things out there. And we're focusing on this little bitty planet, this little bitty land. And, and we, you know, what I do with my astronomy students, uh, I teach at Dirt I love my class. Uh, I get 300 or about 130 fresh faces every semester to lead on this path of discovery throughout the universe. So usually, you know, the students come in and, and they're, they've dealt with parking problems. Traffic, and you know, 
And so I have music playing, and she's the astronomy music, and I put up the astronomy picture of the day. So I have something sort of to get them in the mood to learn about astronomy before we start with the equations and the lectures and stuff like that. So I think methods like that and just getting things out there to the general public. Uh, when I first came here, the first thing I did was I started our public lecture program. I don't know how many of you know we have uh, star parties and public lectures, five events every semester since I've been here. And it's not really supported by any financial things, I just do it because I grew up with Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan told me that's what I should be doing. So that's what I'm doing. More than anything else, it's the public face of physics. It's the public face of and, physics uh, because we have the, the coolest pictures. And FIU is, is actually has a very special role regionally in that regard. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in Southern Cross, our local astronomical society, uh, we, we go out to uh, high schools, we go out to uh, lots of different places and give talks. I think that probably every high school in Miami give talks. Uh, but that's just something that, that we need to do, you know, and we need to get public awareness because you look around and you don't see things in newspapers. There's no science sections in newspapers. There's no astronomy section. What, what, what's our public? Um, well, publishable research and research and teaching is two different things. So this is basically a research facility, uh, or a teaching facility. This is built for the students. So already, we, even with our 24 inch telescope, we just have our 12 inch in there now. I've already had my observational astronomy class take some video of the moon, and we built labs of teaching the moon. We've already made some observations uh, that we can contribute, uh, perhaps to, uh, uh, what we can do is we can look at asteroids as they a star, go by a star, and many different ground stations see it at the same time, they time the passage. We can calculate the size of that asteroid. We could contribute in that way too when we do the 24 inch. So we're already using the observatory for teaching. Uh, the control room that I mentioned before that sort of looks like a Starship Bridge, we just had an international, uh, in fact, that's why I'm a little punchy right now. I was up until about 4 in the morning observing uh, in, from our telescope in Chip in uh, Arizona from the control room. Um, so we control telescopes, uh, on basically one in Arizona, one in uh, Sartolo, Chile, and we're getting a new one uh, now in the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. So we'll have three telescopes, literally three different continents. And we control it from our Stucker Astro Science Center, the second floor. And it's a really nice environment because uh, I designed it. I actually didn't start out designing it to be look like a Starship Bridge. Everybody thought it was just because I'm a Star Trek nut, you know? But actually, um, we had been using the telescopes from my office. And my office is, you know, used to be about like from here to here. <laughs> and so I have like five students in there and me, and it got very uncomfortable. Because we're operating using two telescopes, and we need three computer screens for each telescope. And I have two computer screens. So we had to make windows, you know, very uncomfortable. So I looked around when I found out we were actually getting the Astro Science Center. I looked around and did some research on control centers. I looked at the airport. Control centers, uh, police, you know, emergency management control centers, they have all these screens up. And I finally stumbled upon a renovation in the CBAC, the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility, Newport News, Virginia. They did a like a $5 million renovation of the control room. They had this really big screen, and they uh, had consoles, and they had a place for the PI, the principal investigator, to sit. And I took that, and said, that's exactly what our needs to look like, you know. And so I put that in our room, which is a round room. Seen that before. <laughs> that looks exactly like the bridge of the USS in Japan. So why don't we run with that? Why don't we make it look even more like that? And it turns out that I've used, we've used it to observe uh, three times three nights now, and it's beautiful. It's wonderful. I've had students in and out. Uh, we have all the screens we need. We have separate screens for everything now. We don't have to have every little small windows, and it's, it's wonderful. We have, actually have a good sound system in there, so we actually play a concert while we were observing. Uh, observing is actually quite easy if everything goes right. And the telescope's working, the camera's working, you just watch the quality of the images, they come in, you don't have to do much. If some of the things don't work right, it gets really exciting. Uh, we could have watched the concert, everything was working. So I guess the answer is we can contribute a little bit to research, with it, but mainly it's a teaching facility. That's what it's intended for. The great thing is our local telescope will have the same operating system as the telescopes that are research observatories. So once the kids learn how to use the local telescope, they just switch over to the same operating system in front of them. Same thing. 
And I guess uh, on that same point, just for curiosity, you say um, the telescopes that are out in Arizona and places that are obviously away from cities and stuff like that, but how will light pollution affect the telescope here in Tenerife? And, and do you guys have like certain times to, to observe? And like, how does that come into play? So, uh, well, observing time, uh, our, our telescopes in Arizona, in Chile, and now in the Canary Islands are run by what's called the CER Consortium, or a member of the 10 University Consortium. And so we divide up the time evenly between the 10 universities. So we know which nights we, we ask for specific nights uh, for those telescopes. For our local telescope, we'll have total control over So every clear night we can open it up, our students can open it up. And um, so it'll be operated from the control room uh, on the same computer program uh, as, as we operate from other remote telescopes over the internet. Uh, out of our remote sites, there's nobody out there. It's an empty dome. We control everything from our console, from our computer console. So we can, we'll be able to do the same thing here. But we have the added advantage here. The students will be able to walk upstairs and see what's going on, see the telescope, see where it's pointed, to see what it means to rotate the dome and stuff like that. So the teaching experience will be totally different. Did that answer your question? No, it's perfect. Well, I invite you all to come visit the Stockbuster Science Center. Um, I don't think you've been there since it's been completely finished. Yeah, we'll give it to early tour. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you, you were at the press conference. So. Yeah, well, I joined you. Thanks, Jacob.